You're listening to the Onside Podcast, the podcast for innovation-driven entrepreneurship here in Atlantic Canada. I'm your host, Alex McCann, and this is our first episode for season two. The theme this month is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Today, we have our special guest, which is Xavier Joseph, the president of Breathing Green Solutions, Nova Scotia's first licensed producer of cannabis. Breathing Green Solutions is powered by their proprietary pure plant growing method. Prior to this, Xavier was the senior vice president global marketing for Aurora Cannabis in Toronto. Aurora Cannabis is a publicly traded company here in Canada. For more than 11 years, Xavier also worked for a local company, Color, a digital advertising agency with offices in Toronto, Halifax, and New York. He held various positions as a director of digital marketing, the managing partner, and as their president. He's involved in many areas of activity here in our community and is the new incoming chair for the Tribe Network. Xavier is also the chair for the Ombre Academy's basketball team and is a coach with the Community Y, very passionate about basketball and all things athletic. Xavier, thanks so much for joining us on our Onside podcast. Great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you. We're talking today about diversity and inclusion, especially in our innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. And I shared a little bit with our guests, your professional, your resume background. But I'm wondering if you could tell our guests who aren't here a little bit about yourself, like the real you, like where you're from, what you're into, your background. Such a great question. My background, I'd like to think it's a bit unique. My parents immigrated from India, uh, the southern part of India, Kerala, mm. uh, to Newfoundland, of all places. Wow. Yeah, a little town called Deer Lake. Oh. So we have about 4,000 people in this little town. Uh-huh. We were one of two families of color uh-huh. within the entire town. And within the province of Newfoundland, there wasn't a ton of diversity, is uh-huh. maybe what I will say broadly based. Okay. The thing that I would say, though, is the reputation of Newfoundlanders is very true. Mm -hmm. Um, So some of the kindest and most loving and most caring people I think you could meet anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And I've traveled to a lot of places, too. But Mm -hmm. Newfoundland is a special, special place. So I'd say my nan is a Newfoundlander. Uh You know what uh I mean? So uh when I think about, like, you know, um, auxiliary grandparents and things like that and aunts and uncles and, like, they're all Newfoundlanders for for Mm -hmm. me. And so that is a bit of a unique place to grow up. And, you know, funny story, I remember my dad saying to me, our local priest would ask myself and my best friend, uh, he'd say, Savior, what's the difference between you and Brian? And I wouldn't even... Oh, interesting. Be able to tell growing up because uh-huh. we were just we were friends. just best friends. Yeah, yeah. Right, and that's just the way it was. And so, growing up there, just an interesting environment, mm-hmm. being just completely different everywhere you went. Mm-hmm. I looked at it as a bit of an advantage mm. because I think you stood out all the time mm-hmm. everywhere you went. Okay, and so. Because of my parents' values as well, too, which was a bit of, and I'll say this is a bit of the negative side of it, of, you know, if you want to be really good, you got to work twice as hard, Mm, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Which I think is a standard story for racialized people Mm -hmm. and underrepresented groups and those things. And so I was, that was drilled into me from like the day Mm -hmm. I was born Mm -hmm, is kind mm -hmm. of what I feel like. So Mm -hmm. I was always working twice as hard and Mm -hmm. I was always being pushed and doing all those different things. And I think that created an um, opportunity for me Mm -hmm. because when you're successful at things, a little bit, no matter what you look like, people want to be part of it. Right, right. And so we didn't lack for friends and we didn't lack for any of those type of things. We were also very lucky because my parents were very educated. Mm. So my mother was a doctor. My dad was a teacher with a master's degree. You know, we were doing okay in terms of where we lived. So a lot of th- my friends came to my house mm-hmm. to hang out. And they slept mm-hmm. at my house. Mm-hmm. And my dad fed them and all of those type of things. So it just... I like to think it created an environment for those people Mm -hmm. to understand our culture a bit more and what we were about too. So I joke, if you want a great curry, go to Deer Lake, Newfoundland. There's (laughs) about 3,000 people in Deer Lake that can cook you an authentic Indian curry. Um, Yeah. So so that is kind of where I was born and raised. And then the other kind of big part of me growing up, I would say, is sport. Yeah. And Let's hear about that. Yeah. And and I think sport is such a great, um, I don't know if the metaphor is the right word, but 
it gives you great skill to bring into life, mm. maybe is what I would say. So it's it, for me, it's about values and character building, relationships. The skill is the skill, but mm-hmm. building skill in a disciplined way is something that we need to do in business and in a, a variety of other areas as well, too. And so being involved in, I would say, high performance sport mm-hmm. from a young age and being pushed there and academically as well, too, um, I think it just kind of set up my future. Mm-hmm. And so I give, you know, my parents kind of all the credit for that. And then the people around me who kept me grounded mm-hmm. when things were going well, mm-hmm. because, you know, Newfoundlanders, I think, are, are hard workers. Yeah. But they don't live to work. Like to have fun. They like there, to enjoy there's themselves. A, you know, I think and I think I have such respect for that mm-hmm. because life is short and the people we love, we want to make sure we spend time with those people and spending 24 hours a day in an office uh, working, I don't think is their idea of mm-hmm. what life is really about. Mm. And so there's a balance to all of this as well, too. And so yeah. I try to take all of that, I guess, into how I kind of lead and, and manage people kind of today. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you talk about sports. So we had uh, Julia Rivard Dexter on as well, you mm-hmm. know, former Olympian. Yes. And uh, she talks about her trials and tribulations and the ups and downs of sports and how that prepared her in her life and her career and the resilience and how to win and how to be super humble and how to pull yourself up off the floor and keep yourself going because you're not going to win every game. You're just not. Well, especially in entrepreneurship, Alex. Yeah. And Julie's a great example of this for sure, where resiliency becomes so critical. And I'm involved a lot today with youth mm-hmm. and, and trying to support entrepreneurship and racialized communities, but even starting at a younger age to be able to bring them in and, and give them privileged opportunities that our communities don't often get. Yeah. And so when I think about resiliency, which I think is what you're hitting mm-hmm, on and what mm-hmm. Julie is hitting on, it's such a critical factor because as entrepreneurs, especially in innovation driven mm-hmm, areas, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there is going to be um, a lot of pushback and challenges and failures. And, you know, you need the right mindset mm-hmm. to be able to deal with all of that um, and move forward. Yeah. And I think sport provides a great background especially team sport, I yeah. would say, for those things. Because as we know, business and, and community building is team driven yeah. and no one person can do it themselves. And so I think for me, especially as a point guard in mm-hmm. basketball, where the the your measure of success in many ways was winning the game mm-hmm. and your job was to take the heat if you lost mm-hmm. and to give the credit to others on the team mm-hmm. if you won. Mm-hmm. And so that is kind of how I was raised from as long as I can remember. And so I don't know any other way to... To do, yeah. To do. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, and I, as you were talking, I was like, just to, for our audience and listeners, you played basketball at Acadia. That's right. Here yeah. in uh, here in Nova Scotia. I wanted to just like touch back a little bit about you growing up in Newfoundland and with your parents and their push for you as an immigrant family integrated in uh, Newfoundland. And then, you know, you had to have this background with sports and trying to kind of find your way. But what was it, you know, and I know that uh, Newfoundland is a wonderful place, but was there something that helped you kind of decide to strike out on your own? Or did your parents sort of encourage you to get out and try new things? You know, you did, sports is a great way to, to kind of do that, but was there something else that Absolutely. just kind of pushed you up and out? And you know what? I'm glad you brought it up because I think this is the benefit of having a little bit of wealth when you grow up. So a mother being a doctor, a dad mm-hmm. being a teacher, we did quite well in, in Little Deer Lake. And so it allowed us to travel. Mm. And so we traveled to India every three years. So I've been there like 13 or 14 times, I think, in my life now for extensive periods. Oh, wow. Okay. And then as part of that, every year we are traveling to different places in different countries. Mm -hmm. So I remember, I don't know, being eight years old in Charles de Gaulle Airport Mm -hmm. in Paris, sitting with my parents, watching people from all parts of the world and to see how some of the Africans dressed and some of mm. our Middle Eastern friends dressed and the Asians, and especially to airports like that in Paris mm-hmm. or, or in Amsterdam or other places that I've been at a young age mm-hmm. to sit and watch and to have my parents educate me that, hey, I know you love Newfoundland <laughs> and and everything about it, but it's a global world. Mm-hmm. And so I was very, very fortunate because a lot of my friends mm-hmm. didn't get those opportunities. And so even as a racialized person, mm-hmm. I felt very privileged yeah. to be able to act access some of those things that were some of my Newfoundland friends Mm -hmm. whose parents maybe didn't have that type of job Mm -hmm. to provide those opportunities, didn't get a chance to see and experience all those things. And so that experience of understanding the global and how different everybody is Mm -hmm. 
but how beautiful everybody is. And as that well, there's too. a place for, for everybody. There's a place for everybody. Yeah. And so the respect and kindness. And so I got to see all of that again from a young age. So I take that mm-hmm. with my Newfoundland experience, with my sport experience mm-hmm. and, you know, mm-hmm. my parents drive and all of those things. And I think it really does kind of come full circle into kind of how I lead and manage today. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that I remember a few years ago, we took our kids, we got to go to New York City, this Mm -hmm. melting pot. And I remember we were up in the Upper East Side and I told our kids, I was like, there are more people in this one neighborhood (laughs) than there are in all of Nova Scotia. And just the pure diversity of people walking down the street. You know, there's uh, a kid who's half Jamaican and half Japanese and everybody's here together and, you know, going on about their business. It's really great to see the melting pot or the the salad bowl or whatever. Absolutely. And realizing that people can work together and there's a place for folks. And, and one thing, you know, I wanted to touch on because you, you mentioned a little bit about in how you work and how you lead. And diversity and inclusion is definitely something that has become much more of a topic of conversation. We're talking about it here, even more in the last two years since COVID, since George Floyd, since all of these things have sort of been coming to the forefront. And many organizations are really trying to think about how do I how do I think about diversity and inclusion? What does this mean? I can't even imagine what this looks like. What what would be, you know, like if you're thinking about it, what is a, it, you know, maybe in a business context or maybe even a social context, what is a great diversity and inclusion? What does that look like to you? Like I have a great example of how that could work or look like. I think uh, for me, the belief has to start at the board level mm. with with companies or organizations, whether public or private. And your board has to be bought in mm-hmm. to, to, I think, really two core principles. One is that diverse thinking around the table leads to better decision making and better outcomes for the business. Mm-hmm. And I think the research all points to that. So there's it's hard to argue that, I think. Um, I think the second big point to me is the morally right thing to do to tr- to try to provide I'll say opportunities Mm -hmm. to all different groups and all different communities, especially those that have been systematically marginalized and Mm -hmm. I'll say oppressed Mm -hmm. for generations upon generations. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about trying to right the wrongs of the past and and create new opportunities for those communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an immensely powerful thing for people who sit on boards Mm -hmm. or involved in executive Mm -hmm. kind of groups, because one is my organization is going to do better Mm -hmm. because I have more diverse thinking around the table. Two is I should feel great about myself because I'm doing what I can to help Mm -hmm. other people as well, too. And so seeing I've just kind of felt this always in my life, like you can do things for yourself, Mm -hmm. but doing things for others is a whole nother set of feelings around it. Yeah. And it's immensely powerful to be able to give back. And and that's, you know, you're moving into creating legacy and doing all these things that have generational impact. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, knowing that we're only here for a few years and then we turn (laughs) into carbon, I'm like, okay, what's the point of all of this? Well, the idea that you know, when I'm on my deathbed that I can think that, hey, I've had some type of impact in making the world a better place. And when I look at my child, that they're proud of me Mm. for the things that I've tried to do. I think that to me is what drives me, I think, a lot of times. Mm. Um, And so from an organizational perspective, I think once the board has bought into it Mm -hmm. and the executive groups, then I think it's a lot about bringing in the right professionals Mm. who understand the space. Because even me as a racialized person, I would say I'm not a DE&I expert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I often say I know enough to be dangerous yeah. in a lot of different subject areas. Yeah. And so what you do is, um, and we can talk about this later, but this idea of humility and being humble mm-hmm. as leaders is critically important, I think, today. Because gone are the days where the leader knows everything and everyone is following this person who is like, I don't know, a semi-god or, mm-hmm. a, or whatever it who might be. Who knows everything about ev- everything. Everything about everything. Like that is like, I'm sorry, you asked my wife, that is definitely not true. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would be the first to admit, and I think having a humble approach to how you lead, I think is critical because I think it also now provides other people the opportunity for input mm. and engagement, mm-hmm. which I think is critical. So I look at from a DEI perspective, board, executive, bringing in the right professionals, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then making sure you're educating and doing all of those type of things mm-hmm. as you go forward. Mm-hmm. And so that involves HR, all the different divisions in the organization. But I think if you can do it from that perspective, I think you have a much better chance of success because I really do believe if your board is not bought into this, um, if your executive teams are not bought into this, then you're really going to struggle because they are not going to see it as a core part of the business, yeah. which in real business is about 
driving profitability and enterprise value. And Mm -hmm. so those are the things that people are very much focused on. So if you can't connect it into some of those things, there are some people who are not going to be supportive of what we're trying to do. Yeah. It's interesting. I was reading an article this morning was talking about uh, business schools, MBAs and things like that, and a new way of educating leaders for the future. And I think that in the past, ESG and CSR, corporate social responsibility, these things were kind of like nice to do, kind of on the side. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, just sort of on the side and not maybe really built into the core and the purpose of businesses. And I do think that there's this shift and many organizations are trying to figure out how to do it. What does it mean? And all sides. And and if you're a large organization, you know, you have staff, people, those kinds of things. It's hard to make a shift. When you're a small company, when you want to do it, you just might not have the resources or that expertise that you were talking about bringing it in. Have you seen some examples of some things that have been done right? Or, you know, I don't know if there's some examples from uh, things that have in your in uh, with the companies that you've been involved with, where you've seen them sort of say, OK, yeah, like we can start somewhere. And and I don't think, uh, at least from my perspective, not everything needs to be a major overhaul. You Mm kind of have to start somewhere. Well said. And you have to be willing to take the first step. And sometimes taking the first step is super hard. And maybe you might step off the curb. (laughs) You might might take the wrong step and you have to like, oh, wait, that didn't work. I got to step somewhere else. I often use language with my counterparts and other organizations that we're all on a journey. Mm. And so what I try to do with that is to say there's no judgment Mm -hmm. around where we sit today. Mm -hmm. The reality is what the reality is. Mm -hmm. I'm not blaming the leader that's in that position today of why his company or her company is not diverse. Mm. But I think you described it beautifully in that it is about taking small steps in the right direction. And those small steps slowly but surely have impact over time. Mm. And I go back to, again, professionals. And now I think what we're seeing because of what you described with George Floyd, where we sit from a diversity perspective, like accessing capital, Mm. board positions, executive roles, like we see all of that in a very difficult place maybe or or a very Mm. negative place from Mm. a racialized community perspective Mm. and not where it needs to be. And so I think those steps certainly move towards that. But bringing the professionals in that can push the board and the executive around what true inclusion actually means mm-hmm. is critical because, and I think I think we may have talked about this before as well too, there's a lot of tokenism. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about that. <laughs> right? So there's a lot of tokenism where, and, and I think this happens with females a lot as well too, where mm-hmm. I've experienced that there's a group of males, a female may have a senior role in the organization, but the decision's made in a corner with four guys. Mm. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like, okay, so what's the point of the role? Mm-hmm. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and valuing the perspective. So there's a whole piece of getting people into positions, but then there's a whole nother piece of creating safe spaces, as I would mm-hmm. call it, and inclusive spaces for people to have honest conversations with each other around what's happening and what needs to happen within the organization. Yeah. And so I look at both of those things as needing to work hand in hand. And again, I look back to the senior leader in the organization to say, if they're bought into it and they are going to push this hard throughout the organization, then others will buy into it as well too. But if the senior leader does not feel it's that critical or important to their business Mm -hmm. or what they value, Mm -hmm. then it will be tokenism. Yeah. Right? And I think we see this certainly in some organizations where- Got to get the sticker. Got to get the sticker. (laughs) And I need to, yeah, I need to put it out there in the media Mm -hmm. that we've got this this colored face or whatever Mm -hmm. it might be and they're on our board, Mm -hmm. but it's one board position out of Mm -hmm. 11 or 15 Mm -hmm. or whatever the number is. And it's kind of like, that is not what Mm -hmm. we're talking about here. And I guarantee you in those situations, God love the person who stepped into the role, who's going to try to now push Mm -hmm. because they're from a diverse background. Mm -hmm. So they're going to believe in some of the things that we're talking about here, Mm -hmm. no doubt. They're going to be met with a lot of resistance through that process when they're like, I'm alone here. Yeah. And I've been alone in a lot of places, trust me. And and I'm sure you have too. And fighting for our community to be more incorporated into it is a delicate balance. And I think... There's nuance in how we communicate some of those things. Mm -hmm. So my hope is even with a bit of tokenism, if that happens, that the relationship over time can be built because it's still a small step Mm -hmm. in a direction that we need to go, even though it's token. Yeah. Yeah. We prefer not to have tokenistic actions, but at least if you acknowledge that, well, I guess I need to even think about this. At least I need to like 
try to take the certificate and get the sticker or whatever. Totally. It's a, a first step. Well, I it's totally. interesting. I I hear a lot about inclusion and, and people are always saying we have to invite people to the table and we have to invite people to the table. And I, I've been thinking about that. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's one thing to be invited to the table. It's another thing to be asked to prepare the meal together, to set the table, to sit down at the table, to pass the knives and forks around and to actually eat and enjoy the meal together. That's that's a little different than just inviting some over once in a while at Thanksgiving or Christmas and saying, oh, yeah. You're, we're, you're included. Come, come sit down at my table and eat my food. Yes. You can have some of my food that I prepared by myself. You're included now. You can have some as opposed to like, let's come together and like, let's make something together. That's a great analogy. And I think, again, I go back to like, if as leaders we're secure and humble in who we are, mm. then we want to hear different perspectives. We have to want to hear. Like I often tell myself if I'm sitting around with my executive group and I'm getting the same opinion from a bunch of different people, I'm like, that's not good. Mm-hmm. I, I want to hear different perspectives on things. So we've looked at every possible angle. And then my view is our values connect us together, even if we have different perspectives on things. Mm-hmm. And so that's the, um, I'll say the magic in team building in diverse and really truly inclusive environments, because people are going to say things that others do not agree with or that they don't have lived experience around or they yeah. don't believe should be the focus of the business and all of those things. Like there's a lot of, I'll say old school business thinking where it's like business is about making money. Mm. That is what this is about. This whole idea of social entrepreneurship and giving back (laughs) to the community and caring about our environment and all those type of things. Like really like who we're here to make money for our shareholders. And that's what our job is as leaders. And I don't believe that. And I kind of believe that that's one core part of our job. There's no question. We live in a capitalist world and we've got to provide return on the capital that we get and, and deploy it appropriately. But at the same time, we've got to figure out how to create inclusive and diverse environments Mm -hmm. to protect our environment, to make sure our our kids have opportunities in the future and all of those beautiful things. And so I look at that as leadership responsibility. And if you don't have the perspectives around the table, Mm -hmm. and like we said, I don't know everything, Mm -hmm. you can't make the best decisions for the organization. And so I think that to me is the magic uh, of of real inclusivity and and real diversity at uh, in organizations. Well, it's interesting. We did some work at Onside. We last year released a inclusive innovation monitor, and we looked at the activities, the opportunities, and the outcomes associated with being in an innovative and entrepreneurial culture. And it was very interesting, especially here in Nova Scotia. Some things were doing great. Mm -hmm. We're really awesome at doing research, all that kind of stuff. Probably need some more diverse researchers, but Mm -hmm. no, we're doing really great there. But in other areas, you know, there's like huge discrepancies, for example, in the salaries of black tech workers compared to the Canadian national average, probably about $13,000 difference. Wow. So you see these differences and we're talking about culture change and things like that. And the opportunity to participate, to join into innovative kind of jobs, innovative kind of uh, opportunities and get those skills do have tangible downstream benefits to communities. And if you can't access those things or you're not included, you miss out on wealth generation opportunities. You miss out, you know, in all these stories about getting access to capital, just even start a business, all these things. So we're talking about this, but there are actual tangible, measurable things that aren't great if you are not included which lead to negative impacts kind of, you know, for society and in and, and general. So I do think it's really important for people to think about that or to be aware of that. You know, we're here talking about inclusion and things like that. And sometimes people think, oh, kumbaya and, you know, we're going to hold hands together mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And that that is definitely a part of it. Uh, right. But there's also the part of enabling communities to self-realize, you know, their own goals and objectives and ambitions. So, Xavier, I know you're you're involved in a, a lot of different initiatives and things like that in support of these causes. Uh, what what are some of the things that you're involved in? A lot of different things, I guess. <laughs> but I think, Alex, you you really hit the nail on the head. For me, it's about getting our communities into high growth, innovative, and emerging industries, mm-hmm. because that's where I would argue wealth generation, generational impact, quality of life, all can be significantly enhanced for our communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think, and I see it because I'm involved in mentorship in a lot of other places where our communities are not present in any of these places. And so going to a bank to get a $20,000 loan to start a small business is massively challenging for them. But somehow other groups are able to show up and get $100 million 
of stuff they don't have to pay back Mm -hmm. if it goes belly up. Mm -hmm. And the argument I make even in that world of like the tech and the startup and and the oceans and all of the, the, you know, the bigger tech kind Mm -hmm. of spaces, I laugh a little bit because I think if you told someone from the community (laughs) that, hey, you can go to these groups with a great idea and the right skill sets and the right mentorship and someone will, a bunch of people will cut you a check for a hundred million dollars. And if you lose the hundred million, okay, and nothing comes of it, but you took the right steps and moved in the right direction, you've actually built more credibility. So the next time you show up, they're actually going to give you 200 million for your idea. Mm -hmm. If you thought about that model versus a typical bank lending model, that if I borrowed a little bit of money to start my convenience store, hair salon, whatever thing it is, and I borrowed $20,000, let's say, and I lose it. And I show up to the bank and like, hey, I tried my best. It went well. A few mm-hmm. things came at me that I didn't understand. You think you could give me 40000 now and I don't have to pay it back? <laughs> it's like, so it's mind blowing, I think. Mm-hmm. And so this is about exposure and opportunity mm-hmm. in those spaces. And so one of the big ones I'm involved in is um, I'm very, very, I guess, fortunate and feel very excited to be the incoming chair for the Tribe Network. Yay. Which is focused on, <laughs> as you know, mm-hmm. Black, Indigenous, and BIPOC entrepreneurs in high growth, innovation, and emerging industries. Mm-hmm. And so it is specifically built in some ways to fix the problem that you've just identified. And and I think what really excites me is there's a great team there. There's a great group around the board. There's a great group of advisors like mm-hmm. yourself that are involved in that to be able to ensure mm-hmm. that we deliver on those outcomes and we build the system with partners and others that are out there to help our community get to that level. And so that to me is something that, you know, we talked about things you'll feel proud of when we're mm-hmm, older and mm-hmm, looking mm-hmm. back on. This is something that, you know, where we put our heart into and that is deeply personal for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've even tried beyond just the tribe network to work with younger mm-hmm. kids to be able to provide them opportunities. So I also, I chair the basketball and leadership program at Armbray, That's right. Um, which is a, an amazing school here in, in Halifax that, and it's a private school or independent school, small class sizes, deep care for students. And we were able to bring amazingly gifted kids from different communities mm-hmm. into the school mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with a variety of support from different areas. And to me, what that does is it solves the question that I've dealt with in the past of, hey, that kid doesn't read as good mm-hmm. as another person from another community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we all know privilege dictates a lot mm-hmm. of those things. And so what I'm trying to do there is provide privileged opportunities to our racialized communities Mm -hmm. so that they become funnels Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. into things like tribe and other things like that. And so we build out, I'll call it the long tail. Do you know what I mean? Of starting young and then having them send the elevator back down, if I could use that language, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to others in the community. Because I think we know, especially our next generation, they have a different perspective on how to help and support the world. And I think if we can give them the opportunities and put them in positions of power, I think they'll make better decisions than we'll make. And so that's what I think those two things fitting together, I think, really excite me. I love it. I love it. Well, we're just about at our time. I have one quick question. You can give me a quick little 30-second answer. Entrepreneurship, nurture or nature? What do you think? Newfoundlanders never have 30-second answers. That's maybe the first (laughs) thing I would say. (laughs) Second thing I would say, um, so for me, I think it is more nurture. Mm. And I think... I'll I'll again use a sport analogy, maybe certain players because of their family upbringing and who they're around have certain values that you can't really teach. Mm. And so there's courage or fearlessness or different things like that, that it's hard to bring that to create that with Mm -hmm. nurture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's a nature component of that, I think, in in terms of what happens and at a very young age, Mm -hmm. having that built in your home environment, I think, to some degree. Mm. The nurture part for me, though, is I think there are a lot of people that can become high growth entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. or be in these spaces if they have the right mentorship around them Mm -hmm. and the right people helping educate them on the way to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this is where uh, and I I laugh because I watched a a movie called Glory Road the other day, Mm -hmm. which is about the first all black basketball team Mm -hmm. to win a national NCAA championship in the U.S. And the comment then was having black players on your team was they couldn't play skilled games. They wanted to dribble the ball between their legs and dunk and do all these flashy things. But when it came to playing really organized basketball, people thought at those times, which is shocking, but true, Mm -hmm. that they didn't have the brain power to be able to understand it in a way that a Caucasian person would. Mm. And so all of these teams had all white teams, except this one school in this movie in Glory Road, where this coach was like, actually, I'm starting in the national final, Mm -hmm. five black 
players. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing movie. Mm -hmm. But I think what that idea that people don't have the skill to do this mm -hmm. is just wrong. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And that coach, I think he wanted to show the whole world that they were wrong in judging people that they didn't have the brain power to do this. And he showed them by winning a national championship. And the very next year, all the other coaches, and guess what? <laughs> and now when we look at these leagues, mm -hmm. right? And we yeah. see the same thing with NFL coaching today, yeah. where we don't have a lot of black coaches because of systematic racism and barriers and probably some views that they play. They don't play the skilled positions. Mm. They play the physical positions. Mm. And so, but that is all goes back to systematic prejudice and all of the things that we're talking about. And so those are the barriers I think that we've got to break through as a community. Yeah. Well, thanks, Xavier, for your comments. I really appreciate it. Tell everybody really quickly how they can uh, learn more about Breathing Green and connect with you. That's awesome. So Breathing Green, very, very fortunate to be the president and leader of the company. We were the first licensed producer of cannabis in Nova Scotia, federally regulated by Health Canada, and we sell across the country. Uh, you can find our website, scotia.com is our brand. We love Nova Scotia and everything about it. And we believe in all the values that we just talked about, Alex. I think a lot, what we try to do is bring those values through our product across the country in, in terms of everybody that we engage. And so I think if we do that, um, I think of it a bit like the tree where we're just passing on knowledge to other people that hopefully continue to pass that to others. And then over time, like we said, those small steps, we build a community that we all can be really proud of. Awesome. Well, that's great. All right. Thanks, Xavier, so much for joining us. Really appreciate having you on our show. To learn more about Onside, you can come to our website, onsidenow.ca, and please like and subscribe our podcast. Thanks, everybody. This has been a Podstarter production. production.